Hello, my name is John Reynolds. Welcome to Extraordinary Life Stories. On this episode, I'm talking with serial entrepreneur, Carl Churchill. Carl is a prominent businessman, and along with his wife, Nicole, best known for founding NetPay, a leading payment solutions company that has made a significant impact in the fintech industry. Starting his entrepreneurial journey as a teenager, Carl quickly built multiple companies driven by his passion for innovation and business. Carl and Nicole are passionate about giving back and they are both members of John Caldwell's Life Changes Circle. I'm really looking forward to talking with Carl, so let's get into it. Carl, thank you for joining me. Pleasure, John. Good to meet you. You too. Tell me, who's Carl Churchill? That's a very deep and meaningful question, isn't it? Um, a builder of businesses, I guess, but I, I think from a very different angle than most, I tried to do it in a... Um, morally correct way. I'm a, uh, a good person. I try to be a good person, but I'm not also trying to create wealth just for myself, but opportunities for the people that work for us. So I think in a short fashion, I guess I'm a, a builder of opportunities for, for not just myself, but the people around me, as well as being a husband and stepfather and many other things as well. I love that. I want to really, I want to open that up big time. I want to go back to a young car. Okay. And they sort of early who and what influenced your kind of career and life decisions? Yes, yeah. I, I don't. I don't come from a big business background. My my mum was a carer. Uh, my dad was a policeman. So certainly not from a business background. Um, my parents divorced when I was was eight. Uh, my dad, who's not with us anymore, I, it was a, you know had a difficult relationship with my dad until I was much older. I think he wasn't great with children. Married five times, four different wives. Uh, so lots of history there with him. Um, and I think. I got to a place where when my parents split up when I was eight, we, we just didn't have we didn't have money really. We didn't have all of the things that you wanted as a kid when your friends had new Nike trainers and a really lovely backpack. That was tougher for my family. My mum tried, um, but the bit I could never get around was when I was younger, you'd say to people, you'd see something on TV about, I don't know, America and Disney, an advertisement for Disney. And, and a lot of people I was around at the time when I was young would say, oh, we'd, we'd never be able to do that. I never really could understand, you know, when you talk to people, lots of different groups and communities, they say, oh, I'd never be able to go there. I'd never be able to do those things. And as a child, I didn't really understand that. Actually, it, as I got older, I realised it was a financial thing. It wasn't a, a literal, there's no gates on Disney. You, you know, you can't not go there as a child. But th there was limitations in their own sort of thinking and, and um, their vision, really. They're kind of what they were hoping to achieve. So... I started work really young, so I worked for a family friend on the markets, actually. I was an apprentice fly pitcher, I call myself, but really I sold sweets and cakes and biscuits on so a market store. communication yeah, skills absolutely. and yeah, selling. I, I, I honestly believe, um, I honestly believe if I hadn't have worked on the market from the age of 11, I worked on there until I finished school at 15. Um, I, I think I, I, I'm a lot of my successes as a result of those years on the market because it taught me things that you never, you know, never you learn from school. Now, business studies is a great, great lesson. I have a GCSE in business studies, but it doesn't really teach you about communicating with different people and adapting your style and your speech to the different people you kind of talk to. It doesn't teach you about lots of things that happen in business, but being on a market stall at 5 a.m. in the morning in the pouring rain, you know, bartering with someone because they don't want to spend a pound on some chocolate bars, you, you get to a place where you learn real world experience. 11 years of age, up yeah. at 4.35 a.m., whatever the weather was. And the guy I used to it work creates for... creates a habit, right? A work guy, ethic. Yeah, the guy I used to work for used to say, well, we're here now, you know, the weather might be bad, but we may as well set up and try and sell some stuff. So we'd be there in the middle of Stratford-upon-Avon in the pouring rain trying to sell stuff in the freezing cold, you know, 52 weekends a year. Yes. We'd be there. I worked on the ball ring as well. Um, and, and I did that to try and get some cash together. I wanted to buy my own computer. You know, we weren't in a position where we could go and buy that just off the shelf at the time. So I wanted to earn my own money and build my own independence. Uh, and then I, I got a computer and, and, and just started using it and teaching yeah. myself. Um, I worked on the market until I left school at 15, but I was doing lots of different things as a child. I worked on the market at the weekends. I was doing an IT transition for a car spares place. Monday to Friday, I'd go after school two hours a day. I'd help them move from one of their old platforms over to another, importing all their parts. And it was just, you know, another another job, more cash that I could earn. And then I was doing websites for different people as well, just designing the odd website. When I was a Did you sleep? <laughs> In between all of my schoolwork. It's a funny story, actually, because I, I, when I left school at 15, I got, 
um, through some connections, I got found and got asked to come and um, interview a business in Birmingham um, just to talk about what they were trying to do with digital media, we call it like new media. Um, I, don't think, I don't know if they knew how old I was, I'm assuming they probably did, but I actually joined their business as a owner within their group. They took some shares, I took some shares from the age of 15 straight from school. Uh, and even though they were kind of funding it, I actually took effectively a pay cut after school because I was doing the websites, I was doing the markets, I was doing the car spares place. I was earning thousands every month uh, while still at school. So when I started in business, people think, well, that's great, that's when you earn the money. I took a pay cut to start in business. Brilliant. I, I was doing pretty well on my that's own. That's a pretty <laughs> unique story. <Yeah. laughs> and actually, the, you, you were an entrepreneur, if you like, in context of how you set up to then almost do some apprenticeship, if you like, to then go back into entrepreneurship, if you, if you look at it like that. Yeah, absolutely. But, do you know, the, the funny thing was as well, I, I'd sort of almost committed myself to being an apprentice. I was going to be an apprentice web designer when I left school. All the way through the school, I was thinking, that's what I'm going to do. I, I think my calling's in web design. Uh, and then when I looked at it, I thought, actually, it's quite, quite difficult to earn money like this. And do I really want to be an apprentice? And when that opportunity came along through the contacts that we had, um, you know, sitting there and having the opportunity at 15, I remember having a conversation with my mum where she said, do you, do you not want to go to like college and university? And I was thinking, actually, all I'm really going to be working towards is an opportunity I've got now. I have it right now. It's in the, the dot-com boom. Everything's great. You see all these people getting you know, tons of money for nothing in particular. I, you know, I can, I can do that. There was probably no course. You were so ahead of the time with the dot-com boom <laughs> thing. There was probably no course you could do that would have taught you what you wanted to do because no. it was evolving and moving. Yeah, it was. And it was a huge, you know, incredible time, actually, when you look back on it. it was, if you had an idea, you could think of something on a Sunday afternoon. And you hear these people in Silicon Valley that went to, you know, went to the Valley on a Monday and were given tens, hundreds of millions of dollars for just paper ideas, really. Yeah. Incredible. Yeah. Right. A bit um, of a Wild West time. But you were, you were 15 at this point, yeah. GCSEs. Yeah, yeah. So absolutely. you didn't even need your results we were talking earlier. And, you yeah. know, it's like... <laughs> no, I, I, I wasn't, definitely decided I wasn't going to college. It's not that... It's now, it's funny really, I'm 40 now and I feel actually more like I'd like to go and do a degree now than I ever did when I was kind of 15 and 16. I think it's funny really, I don't need any affirmation of anything now, but I do feel like I'm kind of excited to learn more in different areas. And like when I was 15, I just thought, oh, God, this is so boring. <laughs> I, I need to do something that is using my brain more. And, and when I sat in lessons and I think, you know, Pyrachathoris is three of a theorem, I'm like, ever going to use this in business? You know, I'm just not, this is not really what I want to not be. Just business is life. We all learn how to use a Bunsen burner. Yeah, We're never going to use it again, <laughs> absolutely. right? So yeah. what's your opinion right now as we sit here on the current education curriculum? Being fit for purpose and not, and it's not just because it was effectively set up to, build a workforce yep. and it hasn't really evolved from that. We leave school without any financial literacy and yet we're all going to pay rent or have a mortgage. Yep. There's the whole mindfulness conversation and then business entrepreneur, like someone like yourself that you've still got that, you've got even more of a growth mindset now with your perspective and maturity yep. and even admit that you'd love to go and do another, do a course and so on. But for the kids coming through now, yep. what needs to change? Because it just feels archaic. I, I agree, 100%. I think the, the, the subjects I did okay in at school were the ones that excited me. I did well in business studies and IT. I, I never actually picked up my GCSE results. They posted to me, I had a business meeting. I was already in work. But I, I think I did you well. You missed your GCSE because you were in a business. Was it? I was in, in business. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. I, actually, even I had to quickly silence my phone in my maths exam because I'd forgot I'd left it on. I had to quickly silence that before the invigilator found out it was me. Um, <laughs> so I, I never went back to school. But in the topics that interested me, I did well. And I think that's the problem at the moment is that there's not enough not enough focus on real world skills to try and create entrepreneurs of the future. I, th I think the tide is, I wouldn't say it's changing, it's very, very slow going, more of a trickle than a tide change, I think. But there are some schools kind of almost teaching entrepreneurship, but I, I don't know if it's a lesson that you can learn. It doesn't feel mainstream. No, and, and I think there should be much more exposure. And people like me and a lot of people I would know that are in business would love to feel that was an opportunity to give back to schools, to talk about what success really is. And unfortunately, you get those people, the kind of social media sensations that are almost promoting the fact that um, you can be very, very wealthy with almost no effort and time. And the reality is, as you would know yourself, 
unfortunately, it isn't that simple. You know, you can't just create some Amazon web store and some YouTube content and all of a sudden be a millionaire. Unfortunately, it does come down to really hard work, but those lessons aren't the ones that taught. You know, business studies, even when you're at school, they teach you about economies of scale and all of the stuff that's sort of relevant, but they don't teach you that your customers aren't going to pay and the competition's going to try and nick your customers and your staff are going to be a nightmare on times. You know, that isn't part of the curriculum, but that is the real world. So true. So, yeah, I think there is almost a reset. I think as a country, we could breed incredible entrepreneurial people. Um, but I think we need to do more around curriculum um, by making it interesting to, to kids. Otherwise, there'll be more people like me that just get to the point where they just almost disillusioned by education. And we see so many people come to us for jobs. They've done degrees, masters, you know, gone all the way through that education. And it's in something totally left field that so they're not using at all. They've almost, they're 20 odd and not even using everything that they've they've it's kind sad. of studied for, yeah. they almost lost their way. They yeah. got stuck in that process. Lack of stimulation, right? You know, you did well in the subjects that you were interested in, yeah. and then look how hard you work now. Like we were trying to have a call over the last last month, and you know, and you're an entrepreneur that's full of purpose and passion, and um, effectively in control of your own destiny. But you're still flat out busy. My point being that you could have been, not necessarily you actually probably flipping that more to me where it, my journey through school was I wasn't simulated and I felt lost but rather than then doing some of the things you did yeah I pulled out I pulled back so I was misunderstood as being lazy yeah um, and not motivated I just wasn't stimulated I couldn't I was being told I needed to pass my exams to get a job and I couldn't visualize that no. I couldn't visualize what my job would be so I had yeah. no real incentive to to kind of then do that yeah you know so that's where I think it's broken and two very different journeys to then be two very hard-working, yeah. purposeful people. I, I've never worked so hard in my life. And I, really, <laughs> and I think this is the disillusion, really, that people have is that there's always a stat being quoted that nine out of ten businesses will fail. And I think it's not so much that the ideas fail, uh, but the people behind them fail to understand what it takes to create success in business. I think that's the biggest issue. I, I see so many really great businesses that with more commitment from the people that founded it, probably could have been incredibly successful. They might have delivered all of the things that they dreamed about, immaterial, material, whatever it might have been. Um, but I think the biggest issue is not that they haven't struck on something that could fly. It's just they, they underestimate it's a seven day a week job. You know? And when people talk about work-life balance, unfortunately, when you're starting, uh, starting a business in particular, the balance is vertical. There is, the, there is no balance. You have to just juggle things as best as you can. And that's cash um, flow. That's time. You, know, you, you weren't even sleeping at one point, you know, yeah, joking yeah. aside, not yeah. just filling your, filling your diary up with all the things that would earn you the money to be able to then move you forward. Yes, and you, ha you have to do those things. And sometimes you have to do things that you hate doing. You know, nobody loves doing all the kind of the headache and administration around running a business. But when you're starting out, you are CEO and you make the tea and you clean it and you do your, you're in accountants. You're all of those things that you have to be when you're starting out. And you've got to be <coughs> persistent and consistent with that. So it might be yep. all rock and roll and dare I say, fun and exciting at the beginning, but when you're not, you know, it's a slog and not getting the results and things aren't going right, you've got to stick with it. it, it it's a roller coaster. Yeah, <laughs> and, and that's probably a good way of just opening up your business journey, because yeah. you're multifaceted from being Absolutely. an island last week with a brewery, which we're coming to, to yeah. still being 16 and, and going on to found a business, yep. and then subsequent business. Talk me through the business journey. So I had a, I'd say a kind of web hosting, web design kind of IT type business when the, the one that I went to straight from school, um, it was in the dot com boom. I, I always talk about I didn't, you know, I went through the boom and bust in that I, I didn't lose everything like many people did, but I definitely didn't walk away wealthy. I think I walked away with enough for my bus fare, a bit of lunch and a, and a guy at Coke. I think that was just about my exit, really. Um, but I'd left to, to found a business at the start of what I would call the real world in dot-com, where all of that kind of craziness had fallen away. And it was a bit of a bear market where there was no investment really available. But I thought, actually, that's not a bad time to start a business. At least you can build something realistic, something that's sustainable again. Um, so I joined forces with a couple of, of guys that I, were work, I was working with, um, suppliers. They worked for one of my suppliers, actually. Uh, and we started a business um, called DMC, which was a, another internet and hosting business, but at the start of what I call that, that real market. Um, and, and, and won some great customers, you know, really, really great customers. Um, and we, we built that up. We did pretty well. Uh, we lost the D in DMC really early on. So it was just uh, the two of us. And then I, I bought the other guy out. 
Uh, and then actually after the, within a few years, I then um, merged forces with another supplier um, who was actually where my now wife was with. <laughs> um, and we built then a, a big telecoms business. You know, we took that from the side of her house. When we put the businesses together, I would have been 18, I think at the time, we had about 250K revenue. Um, when we left that business in 2012, it was a 75 million business. You know, we'd really grown it from, from nothing on an absolute shoestring. When people talk about bootstrapping, I think bootstrapping suggests two. We had half a bootstrap on one shoe. It was the tiniest Acclimate. amount of money. But, you know, we did what we needed to do and we worked the hours that we needed to do and we built it into a, an incredible um, business that provided telecom services, mainly broadband. We have 400,000 broadband customers. Um, across the UK, we supported 1,200 other telecoms companies. It was a big organisation. Uh, and we sold that to a, another group, an AIM-listed uh, PLC in 2010, um, <clears throat> which, which made me a, a cash millionaire, so rather than stuff on paper. Um, and, th and that was, you know, it felt like a, a good reward at the time. I felt like I'd, I was only 25 or something at the time. I felt like I'd worked hard. You know, I'd worked a really, from 16, 15, 16, 10 years of you know seven days a week really hard slog so to, to, to feel that level of success for me felt felt good um, but then we went again yeah <laughs> so but the, the importantly you now got a partner in crime who becomes yeah, your wife Nicole absolutely. and you do everything together right so you actually yeah. by meeting through business because a lot of people that I speak to particularly entrepreneurial like, I couldn't work with my wife I couldn't work with my husband people take it to us all the time but you met through we business met, so met. actually that probably helped you yeah we met through work we've worked together now for 23 years so we, we've been in business together for 23 years and so many people say to us I couldn't do it my wife had murdered me or I'd murder my wife it would never happen but I, I think the, the reason it works for us I, I always joke about this whenever I do a talk um, when we first we did the first exit if it wasn't for my wife, I'd be sat on the sofa in a dressing game watching Only Fools and Horses. I absolutely would because I felt like I needed a break. And it was her that said, oh, we'll take a sabbatical. I'll take a year. You take three months. We're literally two weeks into selling that business next. And she's like, we've got to go again. We've got to go again. There's so many things. We can't, we can't retire on this money. And I said, oh, God, do we have to go straight away? Can we not just leave it? No, we need to go now. We can't waste any time. So, so we did. We built a, another business, a fintech business from scratch. Um, and seldom do we kind of, we, we, off, we buy businesses, but we integrate them into a business that we've created. So I wouldn't say that we're like an acquisitive business. If the right opportunity comes along, what we really enjoy, the stuff that makes us tick, is starting with a blank sheet of paper, like what do we do now? What are we gonna sell? Who's gonna buy it? Who, we, who do we need on the team to try and make us, you know, make us successful? We, we start from a blank sheet of paper. So after the first exit, we came out in 2012 and we, we went again and we built a payments business called NetPay. Um, NetPay provided just normal card processing um, services to different SMEs and mid-market customers. And we kind of, we wanted to really differentiate on the technology. I'm a bit of a, I'm like a salesy commercial, um, but really I'm a geek at heart, if I'm absolutely honest with you. I love the tech, you know, I love kind of do, solving problems with tech, I think is definitely something I enjoy. Um, so we were building NetPay and then we made the decision, actually, this business was really two businesses. We could license the tech um, and then keep the payments business ticking over and growing like it was, but we could really try, try and scale this business uh, using technology and go to other payments businesses and say, we've built this infrastructure that's going to make your life easy. You can recruit customers, you can validate them, you can do any anti money laundering checks and credit risk and all of this stuff. And we thought there's a market, there's a market for this. Um, so in 2016, we split off the business uh, and we grew. I think when we split the business, we were about 20 or 30 people. Um, and we grew very quickly. So we won really significant banks uh, across 27 countries of the world. Um, I mean, you name a bank, we were probably doing something for them or doing, you know, very close to them for different opportunities. We processed, uh, we were responsible for something like 40% of card payments in the UK, really significant. Yeah, absolutely huge. And in the US, which was our biggest market, actually, the US was huge for us. You know, we were processing payments for customers you would never imagine. You know, when you sat there, when we take ourselves back to when we sat there with that blank sheet of paper in our dining room, like, what are we going to do? How are we going to create a product? Who's going to buy it? When you sat there, you always dream of those, you know, being sat in an office with the biggest bank in the US trying to sell your wares. You never imagine it's actually going to happen. And we had a few, both Nikki and I, um, my wife, we, we had a few moments where we'd sit in the US, in the US We'd be sat in the Four Seasons Hotel, having had a fantastic meeting with the bank. And you sit there and you think, this is really happening, isn't it? 
And you're like, yeah, we've just done that deal. It's worth At least you appreciated it. Yeah, absolutely. At least you did stop. Yeah. How many people don't appreciate the journey and how far you come from plotting to, I love that. Yeah, it was. And it was, it was a real pinch me moment. You know, we had a few of those. And then um, actually, there's not a lot of positive things you can say about COVID, but we, we grew very quickly because car payments did, digital payments did, banks needed the help that we were providing. So we added 100 people in our Timing's team. important in business, though. At the end of the day, there was a lot of people that suffered, and you, you yeah. made your own luck, uh, and you were, a lot of people were not in a good position at that point. But no. your business actually was, you know, you'd say, good timing from that point. Of view. Yeah, it was a, yeah, as I say, not very many positive things, but that was a timing point. The, the, the one thing I am happy about in that moment is we added 100 people in our team during the, the kind of two years of COVID. And those people, almost all of them had been made redundant by companies that were cutting as a result of the lockdown. Uh, and we were one of those few that grew very quickly during that period. So we could give those people an opportunity to get back into work. They could work from home. We could give them those, the, you know, the laptops, as everybody was doing at the time, and, and get them working on incredible projects. We gave them opportunities to go and work for the world's biggest banks. So it was a, a incredible growth. But, but we got an offer then to, to buy the business at the end of... 21 and, and we sold. Tell me more about that because as an exited entrepreneur along yeah. with Nikki as well, a lot of people say that's the holy grail. I want to know the exit journey on that and then I want to talk to you about the feelings afterwards. Some people start businesses because they're trying to build uh, a legacy and they want to hand it down through generation, generation, generation. That, that, that isn't really us. I think we're, we're more uh, cognizant of the fact that for us, but building a business is ultimately eventually about creating value f- for us as shareholders. But, but that's not because that's the biggest priority for us. It sounds like a really weird thing to say, but um, I always think actually selling a business is a bit of an anticlimax, if I'm honest. And it, it's a, a bit of a weird thing because you've got the cash in the bank you think you should be celebrating. And, and I do, and we, and we do as a couple as well. But almost giving the business away, something that you've worked so hard on. Like your baby. Yes, yeah, your baby. Yeah. And, you know it's part of the do you process. you have a loss of identity at that moment? I don't know, I don't, because we've always got something else going yeah, on. Yeah, I, so, I thought you'd yeah, say that. That's it. So it's never, like, I've not lost everything. You know, we've got yeah. rid of a baby, but we've still got five more in the cupboard, you know. It's a, <laughs> there's a plenty going on. But I, I think it is, a, it is a weird situation. We sold the business to a very, very big US company, a partner that we'd worked with for a long, long time. And they bought everything that we had across the world, bar one country. Um, we kept Ireland, which is the reason we spend so much time in Dublin now. Um, but well, I, that and a brewery, uh, well, a distillery. So my apologies. Yeah, so distillery. A distillery. Yeah, okay. So uh, that's that's almost an accidental venture. Yeah. I, I call my wife and I sort of accidental distillery owners, and it's a long and complicated story. But uh, we ended up um, investing and now running a, a rum distillery based in Southampton. Uh, we make product from scratch. It's quite an unusual thing to to make in the UK. Uh, there's something like 27 or 29 licensed distilleries in the UK that focus on rum, but not many of them make product from scratch in the same way we do. Uh, but that's been, I always think none of our businesses have really been the same as the one before. Uh, and I think that's almost the kind of true sign of someone that j- just believes in what you can do, because I, I would never have said we would own a distillery one day. If I'm absolutely honest with you, my wife and I rarely drink. I mean, we drink our own rum now, but we wouldn't really go out to drink and we don't have those kind of parties like many people would do because we're always working so hard. Keeps life um, interesting though. And yeah. it's multifaceted, right? Yeah, You've got to be learning something new, but you're plugging in the same skill sets, plus there's the challenge to, yep. to learn new things. And actually, I want to just ask you something in context of that kind of exited entrepreneur, multiple kind of uh, businesses and, and previous businesses. A lot is, you can read a lot, you can uh, listen to podcasts about that successful yep. CEO or founder that has to get up at four in the morning, run a marathon, work out in the gym, <laughs> meditate. Yeah. Um, and like, don't get me wrong, you're in phenomenal shape and I want to ask you about that separately. But have you got a routine? Have you got, are you part of this kind of, I need to own the morning, own the day? You know, this, it's like, it's almost crushing to read that you can't be successful about this whole morning routine. Do you conform to that? A- absolutely not. I, I think <clears throat> some days, one of the things we do, we try and do, we try and swim every morning. That's just something just, it's like the, when people say I have the best ideas in the shower, and I, that's a real world thing for me. Sometimes doing something that's not work related, when I'm swimming, when we're out there, uh, you know, kind of just having some time where you're not in the office doing the work, that's often where I have my best ideas. And it's the same with Nikki as well. We'll often come out of the pool like, oh my God, I've, I've sorted that in my head now. I know how we're going to do that. Or, 
why aren't we doing this? And we often will talk in the pool about things entirely unrelated. But but the pool is physical exercise as well. Yeah, so absolutely. it's stimulating that's, endorphins, absolutely. which triggers, and, and you can't be distracted by anything else. No, absolutely. But I, I don't conform to a you know come and do yoga, drink a green drink of kale and spinach before four a.m. That isn't really it's me. Refreshing to hear yeah. that. So, sometimes I'm tired. Sometimes I don't want to get up till half six, seven o'clock. At the weekend, I have a lay-in. I, I don't conform like that. Sometimes I work better in the morning when I get up first thing. Sometimes I work better in the night. Um, often in the night, because it's quiet, I can crack out lots of stuff. So I would get across the businesses maybe 400 plus emails a day. Uh, and when you're doing meetings all the way through the day, it's tough to get on top of that kind of stuff. You know, um, We're not very, you know, there's lots of CEOs that would sit here and say, oh yes, well, I've got my you know, management team running the business so I can go and play golf and have holidays. We have an incredible, you know, some of the people in our business, both of the businesses are just incredible. And without them, we wouldn't be the successful people that we are. Um, but we are in it in the detail. And we're in the detail because I think that's what you need. When people say, don't become obsessed by the detail, I think the reason that we're successful is because we are obsessed by it. But sometimes I'm obsessed by it at 6 a.m., sometimes I'm obsessed with it at 1 a.m., sometimes I'm obsessed with it by 9 p.m. I don't, I don't conform. I'm not one of those kind of LinkedIn gurus that tells people how to run a business. Sometimes I'm really tired and I don't want to get up really early. But, you know, I do it because I need to do it. it just... I think you do whatever the business needs to do and exactly. whenever it works best for you. You've got to be yeah, be, be on it consistently. Yeah. But it doesn't necessarily mean that it's a, a set routine. And actually, you, you mentioned the word there, success. And what I really like about you and everything you've said is there's a real lack of ego there. There's a real, you know, you, you, you've got all sorts of big numbers. You could argue you don't need to work again and you're as busy as you've ever been. Yeah. Sitting here now, how do you define success? I, I guess how I define it now is different than maybe I would have done... 15 years ago, when I was starting out left school at 15, 16, success to me felt like cars, houses, holidays, probably mostly material things, money in the bank, the things that you, you know, you, money can't buy experiences, all the things that you want when you feel like you're starting out in business. I have a very different opinion of success now. And that, that I think has come from the fact that, you know, we have all of the material things that I could want. And Listen, I, could I go and buy a house in 10 of the biggest cities of the world? No, I wouldn't have the capital to do that. But, but I have the money to do all the things that I want to do. We have wonderful houses. I have a bowling alley in my house. I've always wanted a bowling alley. So I have two commercial grade, 27 metres long. So I could, if I ever do find time, which is rare. I'm going to come and visit you. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You're only down the road. Yeah, 100%. Let's do it. Um, so I, I have all the material things, but I think what I've grown to realise, having had the houses, and we have some beautiful houses, we have fantastic cars, uh, and I, I speak a lot about it, that I have cars I haven't driven for 12 months, longer probably, they just sit on trickle charge in the garages, and hopefully one day when I remember, I, I think about taking those cars out. That for me was my definition of success 20 years ago or something. For, for now, now that I have all of those things, they aren't as fulfilling as you think they're going to be when you're 15. That's the word, fulfilling. Yeah. I, I, I always bring it back to fulfilling. And actually, we've been connected by John Caldwell. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And the philanthropic side of what John's doing with yeah. the Life Changes Circle, which absolutely. you and, and Nikki are part of, yeah. um, there's a real sense of, you, know, you even touched on it earlier when you're talking about wanting to go and do a degree to educate yourself to, to mm. be better version yourself to give back there's a real feeling f coming from you that you want to be able to give back yep. and that's been a key um, mission of yours to be involved in because you're so busy right? I guess it works really well with John's set the infrastructure up and Absolutely. putting his own money where his mouth is and so on but is that is that a big part of you know sort of the success if you like that you can then pay back and that, that's exactly my definition of success now, actually. I think that the reason we, we backed uh, Cordwell um, Children principally as part of the Life Changer Circle, I, I like the setup of the charity, great facility, actually. If people have the opportunity to go to Stoke, you should see it. It's world class. It really is. John covers all the administration overhead, so you know every pound you give is going to go and help the, the children that he's supporting. So that was a big thing for us. Um, I, I kind of weigh up. Um, and, and Nikki the same you know when we're sitting there thinking about the things that we want to do in our life and our definition of success I, I could go and buy a Ferrari I could go and spend 350 400 grand on a new Ferrari tomorrow and I could do that I'm in a very fortunate position where there's not very many things I wouldn't be able to go and do or I could buy 20 powered wheelchairs that would change the lives of 20 children for me that's a no-brainer conversation and that really for us now is our definition of success 
through our contributions to Cordwell, last year we helped 116 children. Um, 10 of those we changed their lives through powered wheelchairs and, uh, and other sports wheelchairs equipment. So for me, having a car that will sit in the garage I might not drive for another six months or 12 months, or changing the life of 20, 30, 40 children is really not a question for me. So, so now my wife and I kind of think of our definition of success has evolved. We, our family are fine. You know, our children will never, you know, never should never be without. You know, we can always afford to put them through school and their children through school and all of those things. Sure. Um, but for us to be able to help so many children through things like the Life Changer Circle is absolutely where success is at for us. And the reason we work so hard now is because we want more of that success. But it gives you purpose, yeah. right? You've got, I can feel it coming off you as you talk about it. And as you know, I, I interviewed John Caldwell and, and, you know, for someone that's sold a business over a billion. Yeah. Um, and there are so many people that are wealthy that are so unhappy that don't have that purpose that you have, that John has. How do you, I don't want to say educate, because that's almost condescending to people that have clearly yeah. potentially made a lot of money, or if they've been born into a lot of money as well. How do you almost sort of get this to ripple off from you, John, and the people that are getting that word fulfillment, from yeah. being able to actually have the pleasure of helping people that's um, benefiting these people that don't have you know, a life they can live as well until you, you actually help them. When they do have a fleet of cars in the, in the garage, houses everywhere, but they're not helping anyone. No. How do you... How do you and, and it is, it's a conversation John Cordon and I, had, uh, we've had a few times when we, Nicky and I had dinner or lunch with him a few months ago. And, and it is frustrating when you encounter those people that say, oh, I keep my charitable giving silent. Now, it really, what that typically is a replacement for, I do nothing for charity, so I keep it silent so people don't think I don't do anything for charity. Um, I, I would say, and I do say to wealthy people very often, and I have been eternally disappointed by how... Uh, how little people with incredible wealth, much wealthier than us, you know, people with incredible wealth, how little they give to charity. And I think it's because they've not, because they've not embraced it, they're really missing that opportunity fulfillment. I think if, if it takes a very cold person to think that the decision of buying another car when you've already got eight, buy another sports car, that is a better decision than helping 20 children. For me, it's, a, it's as simple as that. And I feel like I, I do, that's a thing I try and encourage from people when they're starting out in business. At some point, when you get past all of the material things, I think they're not, there's no shame in being wealthy. I think that's important as well. And a lot of people would tell you that being wealthy is a bad thing. It's not a bad thing. I, I enjoy being wealthy. It gives it's me options. choices and options and lots and lots of things. So wealthy, having wealth is not a bad thing. And I'm not negating, I'm not going to sell my house and live in a two up, two down so I can help more children. I, I enjoy all of the things that we've got. But I, th I think there is a point where you say, actually, I, I don't need any more things. I don't need another house. I don't need another car. I will have all the things that I want and my children are all fine. But it is time now to start giving a bit more back. And I think if more people did it, they'd realise how fulfilling it was. Yeah. Um, and I think actually the country that we're sitting in now would be in much less of a crisis if the wealthy people decided, actually, that is a fulfilling thing. I should do more of it. Um, it's a would cultural be thing. I mean, you look at... Yeah, this is a whole curveball conversation, but if, if you look at social media and the definition of success, which is not what you said, it's look at my Lamborghini outside and the du Dubai Marina behind me and I'm, I'm a successful entrepreneur, and then everyone aspires to have that. Mm. You're, uh, I mean, I, I, I'm smiling because when I um, was researching you, as much as we, yeah. we'd connected and so on, if you put your name in yeah. to um, Google and search, it comes up with a rich list. Yeah, yeah. It's probably the worst thing you probably want, yeah, as it. you as Carl told you, this lack of ego and so on. It's like, but that definition of success goes so hand in hand with being wealthy. It's just then people just seem to not share it, not want to uh, no. give back. So it's a, it's a great message from you to be able to do it. And also, I wanted to ask you what your message would be for a young Carl growing up, yep. a young aspiring entrepreneur in today's world. Mm. It's changed. We've got AI. We've got, and with the, the the bright brain that you've got and immersed and current and relevant in business right now, what advice would you give that young aspiring entrepreneur? I, I think de definitely do it. I think that's the key thing, and just get on with it. I, I always in our old office, our net pay office, I used to have a Winston Churchill quote. And it says, I like things to happen. And when they don't happen, I like to make them happen. And it's a famous Winston Churchill quote, and I'm no relation, despite the surname. <laughs> People do ask, but it's definitely not. <laughs> the bald head is the given. Plugging away, the Churchill yeah, 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 <laughs> That's um... it. But I think you've got to be prepared to make it happen. Social media, I think, there's so many great things about social media, and so many awful things that it's done. And I worry about the generation that we're creating now because they watch 
lots of people on there, these supposed influencers, people that are selling courses and Christ knows what else, to, to try and make them rich, supposedly. But the wealth that those people have is not from doing the things they're trying to educate you to do. It's from selling you courses and memberships and subscriptions. That's where they're generating the wealth from. That There are no shortcuts to success, but there are incredible opportunities from just knuckling down and getting on with it and making it happen. But you've got to be prepared to make some sacrifices in time. If you're looking for work-life balance really early on in your business, I'm sorry, you're going to be really disappointed unless you've struck on something very different than most. Um, but I think there is so much reward if you're prepared to, to make uh, the commitment to making things successful. And I think my definition of success now is different, but I'm not saying that everyone's definition of success can't be different. You know, I, I wanted to look after my mum. She has a house she doesn't pay for. She doesn't have to pay any bills. I pay all her bills for her. That is a definition of success for me. But people will have lots of other definitions of success, and they're all right. Whatever your definition is right for you, um, but please do make it when you get to a place where you've got enough wealth, where you've bought all the things that was your definition. Um, giving back is the, the most fulfilling thing. So that would be my message to young me is maybe try and do that earlier on. Because yeah. I, we found I was thinking, bring that, bring that in yeah. early and whatever you can afford, right? Yeah. When you start and... and you, don't, you don't have to give. We, we made a very big commitment, seven, seven figures to, to call to our children, but it's not... You don't need people to make big commitments right. to make a change. Actually, change it starts the habit, doesn't it? It Absolutely. starts the culture. Five quid, um, ten quid, you know, sacrifice two coffees a week, give that money to charity to, just to make a difference um, and just to a cause that you believe in. I, I think all of those things can, can help and it, and it is incredibly fulfilling. I get, I, I get a lot of joy out of making money. I get a lot more joy out of giving it away. It's quite a peculiarity really, isn't it? But I, I definitely do. No, I can share that. I, um, I can remember being old enough to have enough pocket money that I'd saved. I think I was probably 12, 13 years old and it got to Christmas and I, I just went out. I don't think I pers- purposefully went to do it. I went out to the shops and I bought my family presents. And as I started to buy one, I think I saw something that I thought I, my sister would like that. And I'd never done it before. My pocket money was for my toy cars and sweets and whatever. Yeah. Suddenly, that'd be nice for Gemma. That'd be nice for my parents and so on. And I couldn't wait to then buy the wrapping paper, go home and... Um, have these pre- presents hidden yeah. away. And everyone was really shocked yeah. when I produced them. Well, I loved the feeling. And I loved the feeling of it's, it's their incredible. genuine surprise, but also um, appreciation. They've been well thought out presents. And that, that's where mine, yeah. my whole... Um, and that's the start of your giving to... Yes. But I, and I just sort of organically found that. But it's, however people are going to start, it's an awesome culture to be part I, I've of. Never, I've actually never told anybody this, and you'll never find a post on LinkedIn or any other social media about this, but... Um, every year, Nikki and I, we, we, have, we keep ducks at home. We have pet ducks, 50 plus ducks. So I have a pickup, just a ranger raptor that we, we have just to throw duck food in really. But, but every Christmas we will go to Smith's the toy store. We fill the pickup with toys and we drive it to Mission Christmas, a local initiative to give it to families that, that they couldn't afford a present. And then we, we, after we've done that, we go to the cash and carry, fill it with food and then we go to the food bank. I, Every present we give in that process feels so much more valuable to us than presents that we would give each other. We give each other great presents, right? And the kids do. Everyone has fantastic Christmas. But there, there is so much pleasure in doing things like that. Um, and and that's, that for us feels, you know, it's it just, yeah. it's an absolute definition I of success. I appreciate you sharing that. And actually, have you heard of the shoebox? Yeah. My parents do that. And okay. they got so carried away with it. They start the shoeboxes for the next Christmas in the January. Yeah. And my mum, if we talk about purpose, she'll go around all the Smith toys, the entertainer, yeah. and she'll buy the kind of uh, bargain buckets of Sylvanian families, whatever they are, and, and just notepads and all sorts of stuff and fill these shoe boxes and they weren't getting any feedback for years, but these shoe boxes are immaculately wrapped. It's a joint effort between my mum and my dad. And they're not doing it for any gratitude, no, but, no. It, but you just, but then these boxes were being so well received that they started to photograph, video these kids opening the box. They've probably never been given a gift before. No. And that fed its way back to me as well. And that's another thing we were like, there's so much more joy fulfillment in that than receiving anything yourself, yeah. buying yourself something. Absolutely. I, we, it's something we, we we would always do. I, I just yeah. enjoy it so much. It really just an incredible feeling. Yeah. yeah. Well, there's a the, the big why behind the program and wanting to talk with you is that lived experience you get from talking to someone that you know I can learn from. Other people can learn from from sharing a conversation like this. So thank you for talking with me. Pleasure. I really Thanks, enjoyed John. it. Great to meet you. Thank you, Carl. Thank you, my friend. Cheers. Cheers. Thank you.